27 says the Lord is my strength and my shield in him my heart trusts and I am helped my heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him so we're going to sing trust and obey Father, thank you for this day. <clears throat> thank you for this church family. Um, thank you for bringing us all here safely this morning. Um, we just pray that we would have open hearts and open minds as we receive your message this morning and um, that we would be able to apply it and take it with us wherever we go this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Casey. Good morning, everybody. It's an exciting day. Uh, as you know, we are in the middle of a, a transition as we uh, look for the new senior pastor of this church, and we are privileged today to have with us a student from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. This is Jack Voigt and his wife, Narelle, and uh, he's going to come bring our message today. So would you please give a warm welcome and round of applause for Brother Jack as he preaches for us. morning. Thank you guys so much for, for welcoming, welcoming us here this morning. Uh, Y'all have been so hospitable so far. I've really enjoyed talking, talking with a few of you. Um, it's, it's been a really, really warm uh, welcome for us. We feel, we feel very welcome. Uh, so 
thank you for that. Uh, my name is, is Jack Voigt. I, uh, uh, like Corey said, I'm a, I'm a student at Southeastern uh, Seminary right up in, in Wake Forest. I'm originally from Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, I, I grew up there, went to Anderson University, uh, which is also right in the upstate over there where I met my, my wife, Narelle. Uh, we've been married for only five months. We got married in, in May of this year. Um, and, and so we are, we are so glad and, and thankful to, to be here with you this morning. Uh, if you've got your Bibles with you, uh, we're gonna be in Ephesians chapter one this morning. Uh, Ephesians chapter one, uh, verses uh, one through 10. And, and if you open up there, we will, we will get there in just a minute. I, uh, I do wanna extend a, a special welcome to any of, any of you who, who maybe this morning uh, you feel like your faith is uh, fragile, if you would use, use that word to describe your faith. Like yes, yes, we, we love Jesus, we trust Jesus, uh, we hope in his promises, uh, but sometimes uh, the story that Jesus tells us about the world and our experiences that we live in the world, uh, sometimes those things don't seem to, to line up. Like, like Jesus tells us, he's, he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, uh, the one who comes that, that the sheep might have life and even abundant life. Uh, but maybe this morning you, you wouldn't look around at the last few months or, or even years you've lived through and, and describe your life as, as abundant. So what do, what, do, what do we do when, when Jesus' story and, and the story of our lives, there seems to be some, some tension there? What, what, do we, what do we do about that? Uh, I, I had a professor one time tell me that, that uh, faith, faith is not merely about believing in, in the things that you don't see. You remember uh, Paul tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight. It's not only believing in things that we can't see. Uh, faith is also uh, believing despite what we do see. Um, when everything we can see and experience would, would tell us one thing about the world around us and uh, uh, how the world works, um, it's believing uh, despite all that I see that Jesus is, he really is true to his promises. And, and the hope, the hope of the Christian life, uh, hope can actually often be a, a kind of painful experience. Uh, if you've ever gotten your hopes up for something um, only to have them, them dashed, you know that the higher your hopes are, uh, the higher the potential for disappointment. And in the cross and resurrection and future return of Jesus, we have such a high hope, the highest possible hope in all of the universe, right? And so when our story seems to not line up with that, that can, that can leave us feeling, feeling pretty, pretty disappointed. I, uh, Sometimes, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I kind of wonder, wonder if I'm crazy sometimes uh, for, for believing the things that Jesus has asked me to believe. Um, I, I think it's kind of silly when, when we as Christians make fun of other religions for believing things that are, are, are just weird or out there or unreasonable. Um, because, right, we believe that about 2,000 years ago, uh, a, a Jewish carpenter uh, from Nazareth he, he started a movement telling everyone that, that God's plan to save the world was happening through him. The government got pretty angry at him and, and, and killed him for it, but then his followers started telling people that he, he came back from the dead uh, and that he, he had gone up into the sky and he told them that he was coming back soon, um, but, but here we are 2,000 years later and I haven't seen him. Uh, does, does, that, does that ever feel, feel crazy to you? Uh, even if just for a moment. I mean, sometimes I need to be honest with myself and say, look, we, we've, we've sing songs to a guy like nobody's seen in 2,000 years. Like, what, 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 do, we, what do we do with that? I, I love singing, singing songs of worship with my brothers and sisters, but there, there's plenty of times when, when my walk with Jesus feels more like that man in, in Mark chapter 9 who tells Jesus, yes, I do believe, but but please, Lord, help, help my unbelief. If that's where you are this morning, uh, I, think, I think that's okay. Like that, that's okay to be honest about that. We don't need to uh, be in denial about that or, or kind of sugarcoat it. Uh, Jesus welcomes that kind of faith, um, knowing that our faith isn't in, isn't in our faith, but it's in, 
It's in Jesus. So let's, let's read our passage from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. This is, uh, he's writing to some of his, his friends in an ancient city called Ephesus. Uh, if you go read Acts chapter 19, Paul, he knows these people. He loves with them. He spent some time with them. Um, but now Paul is, he, he's communicating them, writing to them a letter. So let's read our text. This is, this is God's word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and, and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him from before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, in Jesus, that is, we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins for our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite or to, to sum up, to regather all things in Christ, both the things in heaven and the things on earth. This is God's word. I, uh, I, I love the Bible. Uh, it's, it's by far my, my favorite book on the earth. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about it and reading it and reading books about it. Uh, I, I love the scriptures. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's, there's many things you could do with your time uh, that's more valuable and more important than, than meditating on and, and reading the words of Scripture. The, the direction of my life is by, guided by a desire to teach and make the truth of this book accessible to people, to help them see Jesus as beautiful in these passages. The Bible is beautiful, right? Think of, of Psalm chapter 19. Psalm 19, David says, uh, Your word, Lord, the word, it's, it's, it's sweeter than honey. It's, it's more desirable than gold. Psalm 119, uh, your word, it, it is a lamp into my feet and it guides my path. Or, or think of Peter in, in John chapter 6. Jesus has a large group of people following him. And then he starts telling them some, some, some kind of strange things. He starts telling them, if you, don't, if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, then you can't be a part of this group. And people are really confused by that, which that, that makes a lot of sense. I would probably be pretty confused too. And a lot of people leave. They stop following Jesus. But he looks at the 12 disciples and he says, okay, this is your chance. Are you guys, you can pack your bags too. You can, you can head for the door. Are you going to leave? And Peter's response, he says, where else are we going to go? Where else are we going to go, Jesus? You have the words of eternal life. That's how I feel about this book. This is the words of eternal life that bear witness to the Lord Jesus. I love the Bible. I think it's, it's God's word for us. It is beautiful. Uh, but, but, but sometimes uh, I do come across parts of this book that, if I can be honest with you this morning, they, they kind of rub me the wrong way. They're, they're hard pills to swallow. I know I'm supposed to have an attitude of submission towards scripture, and, and I pray pray daily that that's what God would give me. But sometimes I, I don't feel that way. Sometimes I come across statements in Holy Scripture that are so bold and audacious and bombastic that I can hardly believe that in a world like this that they're actually, actually true. Like part of our passage from Ephesians 1 this morning that we're going to be, be looking at. In verse 10 of Ephesians 1, Paul writes, he says, all things have been united in Christ. That all things have been uh, uh, gathered together in Christ. That all things have been, here's a fun one, uh, recapitulated, that is to gather under one head 
in Christ. All things in heaven and things on earth have been united together in Christ. I, I don't know about you, but when I, when I look at the world, it, it generally doesn't look like a place where all things have been gathered together in Christ. I mean, turn on the news, right? When's the last time you watched, you watched your favorite news channel and, and you walked away saying, yeah, it sure looks like all things are gathered together in Christ today. Mm. And so when Paul, Paul in this kind of world writes that all things have been gathered together in Christ, that depending on the day, that kind of rubs me the wrong way. I mean, I kind of want to tell Paul, hey man, could you read the room? Like, like are you living in the same world that I'm living in? Or Paul, how about your own life where, where you find yourself in prison or you find yourself uh, getting rocks thrown at you or getting bit by poisonous snakes or being on ships that, that get torn up to pieces by the waves of the ocean? Like, it, it, where, is there a disconnect there? Paul, why are you saying all things are united in Christ? My world sure doesn't look that way. It reminds me of a song by, by a band called the Avett Brothers. Uh, they're actually a, a group from Concord, North Carolina. Uh, they have a song called The Fire. Uh, and The Fire, it's, it, it, it tells a story. There's a narrator, and he's sitting with a group of people around a campfire. And it's a very, very kind of odd, diverse, strange group of people. Uh, there's a young child, uh, there's, there's a college-aged girl, there's a life sentence inmate, uh, there's a first-year preacher, there's, there's an, an elderly lady who's, who's looking back over her life. In the fire, it's, it's a metaphor. The narrator goes around to each person in the campfire and asks them, he says, what, what do you see in the fire? And, and it's the narrator's way of asking, what lens are you seeing the world through? What, what is so pervasive in your experience of the world that you see everything in light of it, that it colors everything? And so, for example, uh, the first person he asks is, is the young child. Uh, he asks the child, what do, what do you see in the fire? And the child is, he's optimistic and, and naive. And he says, I see all the future uh, victories I'm gonna win in my life. And when I look way down the road, I'm gonna be there and, and so will my parents and, and you can come too. Right? Like, it's, it's the child's optimism that, that we love and, and that I think Jesus loved in the Gospels. Uh, but then sitting, sitting right next to the child is the life sentence inmate. And, and the narrator asks him, what do, you, what do you see in the fire? And he looks at his life with regret. He looks, he says, you know what I see in the fire? I see who I could have been, but that I will never be. That, that colors his whole experience of life. The one I'm really interested in is, is the first year preacher. Uh, think about, he's maybe 25 years old, got done taking a bunch of Bible classes. He's got good theology, right? Uh, but the narrator asks him, what, what do you see in the fire? And it, his, his response is, it's, it's surprising. Uh, he says he sees three things. Uh, he sees uh, confusion, uh, question, and loss. Confusion, question, and loss. It's like he's, he's taken all these classes and gotten a lot of head knowledge, but then he gets out there and it's not what he thought it was going to be. Then he says something really profound. He says, I know all about Christ and the cross, but I, I can't explain the Holocaust. I know all about Jesus and the cross and what he did there and what it's supposed to mean for the world, but I, can't, I couldn't explain to you why the Holocaust happened. He says, I just stuttered when somebody asked me to do that. Like, Paul, that's, that's the world we are living in. It, that's what he sees in the fire, and that's what a lot of us feel in the fire. And that doesn't even take into account your own personal life this week. What's the phone call that you recently got that you've been dreading, or the diagnosis? Who's, who's the friend or family member who you love so much who, who is battling terrible illness? Paul says, Paul says that all things in heaven and on earth have been united in Christ. If I can be honest, the world, it doesn't always feel that way. So what do we do? How do we, how, do we, how do we bridge the gap between what Paul tells us and what Jesus promises versus what we experience? What's, what's the grounds that Paul is standing on so that he can say that all things are united in Christ? How do we, how do we bring that tension together? I, uh, I only have uh, three ideas 
uh, three, three points that, that are the grounds upon which Paul is standing when he says that all things are united in Christ. Uh, the first is that in, in verse 4 of this passage, Paul says uh, that, that God loved us before the foundation of the world. That, that he chose us before the foundation of the world. And uh, he talks about, he uses the word predestination in this passage. And, and I'm not going to come in here and, and give an opinion on how all of that fits together and works. Um, but here's what I would say about the Apostle Paul. Um, in the circles I've been around, uh, you know, the circles I run in, we often have a tendency to talk about uh, predestination and divine sovereignty and human responsibility, and it becomes kind of like, a, like, like an intellectual sparring match. If you ever need to spice up conversation, you can bring up that question, and, and you're sure to get an emotional response from people. Um, that never, ever happens once in the entire Bible. This stuff is not merely an intellectual conversation. This is not detached from human life and the human experience. Every single time, every single solitary time in all of Holy Scripture, when an author chooses to talk about predestination and God's sovereignty and how that works with God choosing us before the foundations of the world, every single time he's talking to people who are hurting. The point is not to win an intellectual conversation the point is always to encourage and comfort hurting people. That no matter what you feel and face and what you're going through, God's love for you was there before those things were. God's love for you was there first. That's why Paul can say at the end of Romans 8, Paul asks a big question. He says, what's going to separate us from God's love? Is it going to be famine? Is it going to be the sword, war? Is it going to be nakedness? Is it going to be hunger? Is it affliction? Like, what's it going to be? What's, what's going to be the thing that separates us from God's love in Jesus? Do you know his answer? He says, no, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And here we go. I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from God's love in Christ. The reason he can say that is because all of those things, God's love was there first. Whatever, whatever it is that is pressing in on you and telling you that God might not really love you, God's love was there first. If you turn, turn to page one of your Bibles, even, even turn to the page of contents, uh, Jesus is there saying, I love you. Our second point, uh, God raised Jesus from the dead. That's our second reason that Paul can say that all things are united in Christ. And, and, and before we really dive into that, maybe a sub-point, uh, Jesus entered into the story, the dark story of our world with this cycle of uh, violence and injustice and, and suffering. Jesus has entered into the story. He didn't stand far off. He's entered into the story, and he's felt pain for himself. He's experienced suffering and hurt and disappointment. He experienced all of those things. It's, it's the difference between... I mean, do you know Jesus doesn't just understand your, your hurt on an intellectual level? He's actually been there himself. He's felt it, which means that we can trust him in that. It's the difference between thinking about playing a piano. It's the difference between reading a music theory book and actually learning how to play a song. Jesus has learned the instrument. He's, he's experienced it himself. He doesn't just know facts about your pain. He's been there and he's shared in it. So when we cry out to Jesus, when we, when we call out to him in our confusion and pain and disappointment, you can trust him precisely because he's been there himself. So in the cross, in the cross of Jesus, just when it looks like all the forces of evil have, have converged onto Jesus and overpowered him, uh, God brings life out of death, and God raised Jesus from the dead. You see, in Jesus' day, the people he was surrounded by, for the most part, they had this idea that someday, way in the future, uh, there was going to be this great, great final day where God was going to raise everyone in the world from the dead. And he would raise some of them to judgment and some of them to eternal life. And the thing that was so hard to believe about Jesus in that story is that in Jesus, that resurrection on the last day, it's entered into the middle of the story. In Jesus, he brings the final word of God's story 
back into the present moment. So we can look at Jesus' resurrection at the first Easter and see, yes, God will keep his promises. He's, he's already begun to do the thing that he's promised to do. That's why in, in John's gospel, by the way, when John talks about the resurrection, the first Easter, he cannot stop talking about gardens. He can't stop using garden imagery. And that should call our attention back to Genesis 1, the Garden of Eden, which, which Adam and Eve had to leave. Jesus brings back what we lost at the beginning of the story. And if you go read Revelation 21 and 22, at the very end of the story, there's a garden there too. Jesus, in Jesus, the beginning and the ends of the story, God's good plan for the world and God's good deliverance on his promises at the end of time. In the resurrection, we can see that God has made good on his promise. And all of those who trust in the crucified and risen Jesus, we can know that we will share with him on the last day in God's promises. God didn't let death get the last word for Jesus. And the same is true for all those who trust in him. The third point, why can Paul say that all things are united in Christ? Number one, he, Jesus, uh, God in Jesus has loved us from before the foundations of the world. He chose us before he created anything. Number two, God raised Jesus from the dead. And finally, number three, God will love us on the last day by raising us from the dead. You see, the, the way the Bible talks about it, our ultimate hope, the thing we're looking forward to, is that someday... Jesus, he's going to show up, just like he said he would. He's going to show up in person. It's not just some uh, uh, spiritualized, uh, metaphorical showing up. Jesus, he will physically show up, just like he said, and he will, he will raise us from the dead. Those of us who have passed away at that point, we will receive new bodily life, new resurrection with Jesus in a new creation. Uh, to take a page out of uh, Tim Keller's book. It's kind of like the end. If you've ever read uh, uh, The Hobbit, if you've ever read The Hobbit books, um, after this long journey uh, of suffering and, and affliction, uh, Sam the Hobbit wakes up and he sees Gandalf the wizard and, and he looks at him and he says, Gandalf, I, I thought you were dead. I thought I was dead. And then he asks him a question. He says, Gandalf, does this mean that everything sad is going to come untrue. Is that what this means? And in Jesus, that's actually very similar to our question. Jesus, does, because Jesus is alive, does that mean that someday everything sad is going to not be true anymore? And the answer is yes. In Jesus' resurrection, we have the, the first fruits of that promise so that we can look to the last day and there actually, there is hope and we will share in that with him. He's going to come back and wipe away every tear from the eyes of his people. It's not just that we get a consolation prize at the end. It's that Jesus comes and makes all the sad things untrue, and we will be with him forever. So in closing, I, uh, I don't have a list of things that you can, you can do this week to, to go and practice, but I, I would like to reframe the story of our world, our, our seemingly and, and maybe rightfully so seemingly hopeless world. What happens when we read these three truths back into the story of our universe? That, that God loved us in the beginning, that God raised Jesus from the dead, and that God will love us on the last day by raising us from the dead with Christ. Here's, here's what happens. Uh, Jesus gets both the first word of the universe and the final word of the universe. If you think of our world as one great big story that the Bible pictures, the first and last word both belong to Jesus. And it's God telling us that he loves us in Jesus. Verse four and five, uh, he predestined us in him from before the foundation of the world. In his love, he chose us beforehand for adoption through him. Before God says, let there be light in Genesis 1, he looks at his people and he says, I love you. That's how the story of our universe starts. And no matter what you feel or face, you can hold on to that. Whatever it is, Jesus' love for you was there first. Likewise, uh, the last word of our, our universe is once again, Jesus saying, I love you by raising his people from the dead. The first and last word, they belong to Jesus. I don't know if any of you guys are interested in, in poetry, uh, but if you ever read a poem 
and you notice that the author uh, starts and ends the poem with the same word, or maybe even the same idea, uh, we would call that maybe like a bookend or maybe an inclusio. Um, but when you do that, when you have a poem and, and the first word is the same word as the last word, um, what the author wants us to know is that you have to read everything in between there. You have to read the whole story in light of the ends. You have to read the story in light of its bookends. And the story of our universe is bookended with Jesus' love for his people. For those who are in Christ, who have put our, our hope and our trust in Jesus, death doesn't get the last word because the last word is resurrection life in a new creation. And if we want to know what this word looks like, the word that begins and ends the story, this is precisely the word in John chapter 1 that he tells us, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. If we want to know God's word of love, we look to Jesus. We always look to the person of Jesus. That is Hebrews chapter 1. God has spoken to our fathers, but in these last days he has spoken to us in his son. Jesus is God's final and definitive word for his love towards his people. And because we know both sides of, of the story that feels pretty dark right now, we can, we can actually walk through this life in this story as people who know how the story starts and we know how the story ends. And that has to change everything about the way that we understand the present moment. That Paul is actually right. He actually can say that all things are united in Christ. If God didn't raise Jesus from the dead, he doesn't love us. Paul says that much in 1 Corinthians 14, that, that if God didn't raise Jesus from the dead, there's, there's, he didn't love us in the beginning, he doesn't love us now, there's definitely no hope in the end. Paul says, uh, if God didn't raise Jesus from the dead, uh, if we only have hope in Jesus for this life, we are, we are the most pitiable people on earth. Man, everyone should feel really sorry from us, for us. But that's, that's, that's not the story. God did raise Jesus from the dead, bodily from the dead. So how do, we, how do we land the plane? How do we tie it all together and put a bow on it kind of succinctly? What gives Paul the grounds to say that all things, all things in heaven and earth are united in Christ? Here's how I'd say it. All things don't get summed up in a dead man. All things don't get united in a dead man. All things don't get gathered together in a dead man. All things in heaven and earth do not get regathered, recapitulated in a dead man. But in a risen one, they do. In a risen man, all things can be united in heaven and earth. And look to Jesus, he is that man. He is the man that God raised from the dead. And that changes, that, that changes everything. God raised Jesus from the dead. And in this dark world, that's, that's enough. God raised Jesus and he will raise us someday. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you that, that you love us, that you keep your promises. As we walk through, through this life, which can be daunting and difficult and dark. Help us to be people who, who hope in your promises and in your cross and your empty tomb. Even when we feel like that man in chapter 9 who has to say, uh, Lord, help my unbelief. Uh, Jesus, help us by pointing us to, to the cross and empty tomb. Help us to be people who cannot get over, uh, over your resurrection, Lord. Uh, and help us to firmly set our eyes and our hope on that final day when you make all things new and you wipe tears away from, from every eye. Jesus, have, have mercy on us. Be kind to us today uh, and, and help us to, to love you and our neighbor. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Let's stand and sing as we close. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes 
eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. O'er us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Let us bow for prayer. Father, as we come to the close of this service this today, Lord, we ask that you be with each of us as we go to our separate homes. Guide and direct us through the week ahead, Lord, that we might share you with others as we go forth each day. And Father, we thank you for the message that we have had today, that it has been filling to each one of us, that we might carry that message with us and and also be willing to share it with others at all times. Father, guide us in everything that we do and say, that it will be pleasing unto you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.